Ryan Richardson, welcome to In Conversation. Thank you for having me. How safe really are these COVID-19 vaccines? Because don't vaccines traditionally take many years to develop? It, it is the fundamental question, Lynn. And, and from the very beginning, it's been our first priority and it continues to be our first priority to maintain safety for people around the world. It's true that we've seen a vaccine developed here at unprecedented speed, but I can assure you that no, no corners have been cut. And actually, if you look over the course of 2020, we tested this vaccine in well over 43,000 people in the phase three study alone. And those studies are still ongoing with very few side effects, or very, very tolerable side effect profile observed. Well, why isn't it that you know, vaccines weren't previously done this quickly? Yeah, I think there's a, co a combination of factors that have, including regulatory pathways that have kind of been established over time. Um, and, and I think what we have here is we've got, we had a, a mobilized effort across the board from regulators, from governments, from the scientific community, and obviously from industry as well, to do what we could to, to put resources to bear to really focus the best and brightest minds across the world from these different segments of the economy and from, the, and, and from society to try to, to, try to solve this, this problem uh, posed by COVID-19. And so I think what you saw here was, was actually the trials that were conducted um, fit with standard protocols, but you saw decision-making speed up and you just saw a huge amount of resources brought to bear. Um, and that helped us achieve what an ama was an amazing accomplishment as we look back to 2020, to have a vaccine developed in, in 10 months time. So would it be fair to say that this is because there's been much greater coordination in the scientific community, there's been a lot more resources and, and just a lot of the bureaucratic red tape that there used to be in the past. I mean, you know, governments and, and uh, various health bodies have just been quicker in making decisions. That's, that sped things along as well. Absolutely. And I think it, it speaks again to, to cross-sector collaboration and global collaboration. And, and just the sheer amount of scientific um, inquiry and, and learning that took place over that short period of time, I think also helped facilitate that. There were publications coming out daily. I think we'll look back on this experience with COVID-19 vaccines as having been a defining moment for the, for the biopharmaceutical industry and also for the, the global public health community at large. What about people who say, we don't know the long-term impacts of the vaccines, because no matter how long you've been doing this, with all the tests and all the trials, it can't have been for more than several months. So we don't really know what's going to happen in, let's say, several years, do we? I think first, it's important to note that we've been testing our mRNA vaccines for over seven years in humans. And actually, the body of research that we're building on here goes back over 20 years that the, the mRNA vaccines have been have been developed and tested. So there is, we do have long-term data. And actually in the cancer setting, we have dosed these vaccines at much higher levels and much higher frequencies. We have a very good understanding of the vaccines and we have comfort that these vaccines are, are safe. The, the second point I would make is that um, when you look back to the history of vaccines, actually most vaccine side effects were noted in the, in the early phase uh, of testing. And so far what we've observed um, is actually a very low rate of side effects. But we've also seen some cases where people who have allergies have had more severe effects. So what about people who say, but you know, I have allergies, you know, I, I tend to have flu, or I tend to you know, sneeze in, in the springtime. Are those the kind of allergies that we should be worried about when we're taking something like a vaccine? So, so this is something different. So what we have observed is that there's a small percentage of people who have had a history of severe allergic reactions that, have, that can experience an anaphylactic reaction to the vaccine. We're continuing to monitor that. In the clinical trial, we actually did not observe that. And that's because we excluded people who had a history of severe allergic reactions. So I think it's, it is important that public health officials um, take precautions to make sure that those individuals with a history of severe allergy, and we're really talking severe here, um, but that those people are identified and that, that, that precautions can be, can be made to avoid that. So we're not talking about persons who just have, let's say, the sniffles, you know, when they have a cat in the room. That's not considered severe. Um, you're talking about people who really go into, into you know, anaphylactic shock or, you know, are, are really have something very, very serious happen uh, from the allergy. 
Th that, that's, that's correct. So we're talking about what appears to be one in, in 50,000, one in 100,000 order of magnitude. Um, so this is a very, on the severe end of the spectrum, not uh, typical hay fever or cat allergies. What about persons who say that uh, a wait and see attitude? Why not let other people take the vaccine first and I'll wait and see what happens to them. What would you say to them to convince them that they shouldn't be doing that? Well, I, I think that, you know, we're in a situation right now where with COVID rates rising around the world and, 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 and a, just a, a tremendous impact on public health and on, on economies, I think it's important that, um, that these vaccines be rolled out as quickly as they can be, um, given that the, the body of data that we already have supports the risk benefit here. In, in a very strong way. And I think we've seen unanimous decisions from the global experts in country after country that have come to that same conclusion when they really look at the data. I mean, if I would say it in a simple way, does it mean that you know I'd be safer with the vaccine than without? So I think it's the, the choice on whether to, to take the vaccine or not is an individual's choice. But from a public health perspective, the data would indicate that yes, the benefits of taking the vaccine um, uh, far outweigh the risks. What about the latest one we've been seeing, though, about how many shots you're supposed to take? At the moment, the BioNTech one is supposed to be two doses. But there are some countries who are trying to say that perhaps we should only give one dose um, because they're trying to spread it out as much as they can and give the other dose much later. Is that a good technique? Can you only just have one shot and that'd be enough? So yeah, it's a very good question. So the, the data that we have produced now in uh, in over 43,000 subjects in the phase three study and, and, and more in the earlier studies has all been done with a two dose regimen, two doses of the vaccine 21 days apart. And I think it's very important here to, to continue to, to be driven by the data. So th that's, that's our view on this. I think we will continue to collect more data over time. The instances that you cite do speak to just the severity of the global problem that we face and some governments um, we'll, we'll have to make decisions as to how they address the, the, the challenges that they're facing locally or in, the, in, in, those, in, in their regions. We're driven by the data and we believe that that's the most prudent approach and, and rather the, the focus should be on expanding supply to, the, to our, our greatest ability in order to meet this challenge. So when, so when governments come back and, and, and ask you, you are telling them, please stick to two doses. Don't do the one dose and then wait and wait and wait. So yes, so we're, we're in very active dialogue with governments around the world uh, uh, on this issue and others uh, related to the vaccine. And, and uh, yes, I think we, we're going to stick to the data. Uh, we're we're scientist-driven company. And, uh, and we think that, um, that the, the data speaks for itself and we should follow the data where we can. How soon uh, after I have a, a vaccination am I, so to say, protected? Right. So in our phase three study, uh, where we demonstrated 95% efficacy in preventing symptomatic COVID infection, um, our cutoff point was seven days after the second dose. So that's on day 28 after the first dose. Um, so so that, that, that's where I would start. It is also true that we have started to see already some benefit, some protective benefit uh, around 10 to 12 days after the first dose. Um, but... Um, but for the full protection, and, and we also think likely durable protection, we think seven days after the, the, the second dose is, uh, is where we would draw the line. Okay, so in, in all, perhaps it would take about a month before, you know, between the first dose and then taking the second dose and then the seven days after that. Th that's what the data indicates. That's correct. That that's, that's where we feel confident that protection is fully kicked in. When you, one says that we say you're protected, does this mean that you don't have to wear a mask? <laughs> uh, 
Um, no, so I think that you know masks are uh, are one strategy to prevent uh, or or to reduce transmission. Um, we, we still believe that that's an important uh, that's an important tool in the public health toolkit. Um, and, and our hope is that the vaccines um, can can uh, really stop this pandemic in its tracks and work in a complementary fashion with with a mask. Uh, and, and other mass strategy and other public health measures. So in other words, no, you still have to wear your mask. <laughs> just because you've been vaccinated doesn't mean you can just swan out there and not wear your mask. It's probably still prudent, uh, g given the high rates of transmission globally, it's still prudent to, um, to, to, to wear a mask. The other thing that people have looked at is, is the, uh, the way that specifically, for example, BioNTech's uh, um, vaccine works. It needs to be kept really cool. Now, how do we know that in the whole transportation from Germany coming out here to Asia, and how do we know that, so to say, the vaccine is still good when we're inoculated? Sure. So it is true that for long-term storage, the vaccine requires a minus 70 uh, temperature control. Um, but we do have actually five days at the point of use at two to eight degrees, so a normal fridge temperature. So in that respect, it's not so different from any other vaccine. Um, uh, I think in terms of transport, you know, we've taken uh, great effort with our partner Pfizer to ensure uh, that we have a system in place to deliver vaccine globally. And, and we've already seen now that we've been delivering to um, over 50 different countries and regions around the world, um, that that system is actually working quite well. Um, and, uh, and so I think we're, we're well placed with a, a global logistics leader like Pfizer to be able to execute this mass vaccination campaign. Is there any way that uh, the person who's actually vaccinating uh, a patient would know that the uh, vaccine has been exposed to, you know, not good conditions, so to say, where it's been warmer than it should be? We've actually incorporated temperature control mechanisms that can measure the, the temperature that the vaccine has been stored at, so throughout the transit process. So we already have that as a quality control measure uh, sort of baked into the, to the logistics uh, approach that we're taking here. So how do we know that the person who's vaccinating the patient is certain that the vaccine hasn't been stored incorrectly and it's still effective? I mean, is there any way you can look at the vaccine and say, oh, okay, you know, it's, it's okay, or no, you've been compromised, a bit like, to put a horrible analogy, like ice cream that's melted? We, we actually have um, a monitoring system built into the, into the, sh the, the shipping containers that monitors in real time the temperature that, that the vaccine has been, has been at. So you could see on the you could see on the container whether it has exactly. been exactly. We actually have this as a quality control measure that that will that gives us confidence that the vaccine that we're supplying has been uh, has met the storage requirements along the way. questions here in Asia. Um, some people say that vaccines like the Pfizer-BioNTech vaccine are rich countries' vaccines. It's much, much more expensive than, you know, a few dollars. It's up at that $20, and that's, that's pretty expensive for a developing country. So our intention from the very beginning uh, has been to distribute our vaccine globally around the world, across countries, regions, continents, etc. And, and that's actually one of the reasons why we pulled together from very early on in this process, a broad consortium um, working with not only Pfizer, but also with Fosun Pharma in China. And we're also working and collaborating with other potential partners such as the COVAX um, unit, which, will, which seeks to supply vaccine to the developing world. So, so it, we see our vaccine as a vaccine for the world. And it's very important to us that we, um, that we're able to make good on that intention and actually be able to send vaccine uh, to all corners of the world. And will you price it accordingly so that developing countries can afford it? We'll have a differentiated pricing strategy. Um, so in some regions, the price will be very low. 
and some other reasons it might be a little bit higher. I think overall, the price that we've set here is well below the typical market rate for a highly innovative, highly efficacious and safe vaccine. We're in a pandemic, we recognize that. And from the very beginning, we sought to try to balance the need to number one, recognize the, the huge investments that went in to developing this technology over the past 12 plus years. Um, but on the other hand, recognize that global access is of extreme importance to us, both as a company and also as, as people. And, and so um, we priced the vaccine accordingly and, and we've priced it to ensure global access. So in other words, you would price it at a lower price for let's say Indonesia or India than you would let's say for what it was sold to the US. So I can't speak to specific regions per se, but yes, there is some differential pricing where we've taken into account uh, the, we've taken the, the local um, uh, economic uh, reality, uh, again, with the intention of trying to make this vaccine available broadly. What about uh, those who ask that a lot of the third stage uh, trials that have been done uh, have not actually taken place in, uh, in Asia. So as an Asian, you know, should I feel comfortable and say, hey, have you done enough tests on you know, trials with Asians for me to know that this is good for us and works for us? It's a very important question. And, and again, from the beginning, when we started the trial program, it was important for us to get a diverse group of people in the trial, both in terms of ethnicity uh, representation, but also in terms of age, right? In terms of even comorbid subpopulations. So the trial was set up very deliberately to, um, to, to hit a broad swath of the global, of the human population. And, and on the Asian point specifically, I can say uh, really two things. One is we had a number, substantial Asian population already, Asian ethnic populations in our global phase three trial of over 43,000 people. But we're also conducting now parallel studies in China. We're actually the first foreign company to conduct a phase two trial of a COVID vaccine, mRNA COVID vaccine in China. Um, and the goal there is to replicate the data that we've already observed in the trials in the US and Germany and globally um, to be sure that we're that we have the same effects in that in, in the Asian population. And the data from the China trials will be all available for everybody to look at. So uh, we will use that data first and foremost to supplement our China um, uh, authorization pathway. So we will submit that to the authorities. And I do expect, as we've done all throughout 2020, that we will make data available in the form of publication. We've tended to publish our data. We'd like to do that in a transparent way, put the data out there for the scientific and public health community to be able to digest it, learn from it. And I think we'll, you'll, you'll see us continue to do that. What about these variations of the COVID-19 that we're beginning to see in the UK? If you're vaccinated with the Pfizer-BioNTech vaccine, Will it be able to take care of all these variations as well, or will I need to get a new vaccine? That's a very good question. So, so far, um, we have tested over 20 different variants um, with the current vaccine, and it's created antibodies that, that are neutralizing against those variants in every, in every case. Um, so we do feel confident that the vaccine has broad spectrum protection. Now, it is still possible that a new variant could arise um, that may require a modified uh, vaccine. And, and so we're gonna continue to monitor that and we're working closely with partners uh, and, and the research community to, to monitor that and monitor those new variants as they arise in real time so that we, we can be prepared um, to make changes to the vaccine if need be. So it's possible that you might have a, a, a Pfizer-BioNTech 2.0 vaccine sometime later on if necessary? It, it, it is possible. And, and I think more broadly, we, we do plan to um, continue to do research on the, in the COVID-19 space. Um, uh, and uh, and we, we have a number of different follow-on candidates, vaccine candidates that we're already working on um, that might improve on certain aspects uh, of the vaccine profile. So, so absolutely, I think we're, we're in it for the long term. How long do you project that these vaccines can protect a person? How many months or how many years? So we don't know for sure yet because we don't have the data, but we believe that immunity is likely to be for at least a year. 
initially. Uh, we should learn more about that as more data from our trial and from the broader research community comes in uh, over the course of this year. Um, but at least a year would be our, our current assumption. Do you think that there's a possibility it might end up being something like the flu vaccine where we have to get a new one every year? There, there is a, a possibility that we may need to reboost to uh, ensure durable protection, durable uh, immunity. Um, so again, we'll have to see when the data comes in. But I think if that scenario pans out, I think we'll, our technology is very well suited to that. mRNA can be redosed, revaccinated, um, because we don't induce immunity to the, to the vaccine itself. Some of the other technologies have that limitation. So I think if that, if, if that happens, I think we will, um, I think our technology is well suited. Now, Ryan, if your mother would come up to you and say, you know, I've been thinking about this vaccine and they've offered it to me, should I take it? What would you say to her? So you've asked me a, a hypothetical question, Lynn, and I can actually answer uh, in, in reality, which is both of my parents are frontline healthcare workers in the United States. They're both medical doctors and they both received our vaccine. So that's an easy answer for me. Ryan Richardson, thank you very much for being on In Conversation. Thank you, Lynn.